Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, licensing and regulatory committee meeting. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce myself. I'm Brian Strong, and chair of the committee. To my left is. Uh, I'm Jim Higginson, deputy chair of this, of this committee. Nicola Perry, Democratic Services. Dave Jones, head of public protection. Lindell Gorman, principal licensing officer. Lee Beach, Licensing Officer. Um, Anne Webber, Member of this Committee, good morning, and also um, a member for um, St. Albans and Tinton for the county. Thank you. Dave Evans, Member of this Committee. Jamie Trahan, Member of this Committee. Richard Roden, Member for Dixton with Osbaston, a Member of this Committee. Good morning, Chairman, Councillor Howarth. Good morning, um, County Councillor Lynn Indicuppy, member for Roggett Ward. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any apologies? Yes, Chair, we've had apologies from Councillor Ruth Edwards. Uh, declarations of interest, as and when? Thank you. Right, item three on the agenda is the street trading in Abergavenny, and I think uh, David Jones is uh, leading us on this. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, if I just highlight the main issues um, that's outlined in the report, it's um, to consider existing street training arrangements in Abergavenny, um, noting recent concerns over the August bank holiday weekend. And I think uh, clearly, if we can't make a decision in Abergavenny, it'd be uh, a policy regarding the entire county. So anything we uh, may or may not think are issues for Abergavenny, we need just to think that through in terms of the county um, position. So the recommendations will come back to that, Chair, but it would be, number one, to uh, outline what occurred uh, August Bank Holiday Saturday, which raised some concerns. And secondly, um, just to, to consider the, the, the way forward, I've got an update from a state, which I'll get to, so um, we'll come back to the recommendations. For a state, so I think I'll have a, 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 an updated opinion as to uh, what we do in terms of block street trading. So that's the uh, purpose of the report, Chair. In terms of the um, key issues, as, as I referred to, August Bank Holiday Saturday was it what, we, what was a topping out ceremony, and that's all to do with the pedestrianisation, for those of you who know Abergavenny, in terms of the, uh, the, the paving, etc., that's occurred along the High Street and Frogmore Street in Abergavenny. There was a ceremony on the Bank Holiday Saturday. Uh, some of those uh, local councillors attended that, and some some concerns were raised about mobile vehicles situated on St. John's Square on the same day. Specifically, as per 3-1, County Councillor Sheila Woodhouse emailed the Chief Exec on the 29th. Her main concern was uh, regarding a large burger van that was um, trading off St. John's um, Square. For those of you not so familiar with Abergavenny, that's the paved area immediately outside the post office immediately in front of the uh, King's Arms. So between the King's Arms pub and the post office, there was a um, large burger van and five other traders on Bank Holiday Saturday. She raised that a concern with a particular issue in terms of how that impacts on local businesses, this issue about they pay rates and perhaps um, mobile vehicles um, don't. Um, in addition to that, Councillor Maureen Powell raised the same issue at full council on the 19th September last month, and that was directed to Councillor Sarah Jones as the cabinet member for responsibility for licensing. And then also, Brinnicum Committee also raised the issue on the 25th of September, and that was left that this would be discussed at this committee for a further discussion. So, in response to those issues, um, I responded to those questions. Uh, like I say, <coughs> Councillors Woodhouse and Powell, same issues. So I highlighted the existing street trading policy, which members agreed on uh, February 2016. Um, and we copied that, if, um, if we want to have a quick uh, look at that, but it's attached for information. Um, so some of the issues that came out were what about the fact that you know, similar traders could be in the town um, and they, that their business could be adversely affected by a, a mobile vehicle um, turning up. So that the Existing policy does refer to not allowing street traders uh, trading within 100 metres of fixed premises selling similar goods, and that is 
existing in our policy section seven. Um, however, and this is quite a big however really, uh, exemptions can be made, and obviously we had the Abergwynny Food Festival a few weeks ago. So as long as it's by agreement with local traders, um, uh, clearly the food best would be a good example of, it'd be odd I think for traders to object to that because it brings a huge footfall for the, to the town. Um, certainly on the Saturday is absolutely packed, so I think that's obviously gotta be a good thing for the town. So as per my opening statement really, we've gotta be very, um, we've gotta be, um, have regard for the, um, for traders and what, what's obviously works for them, hence the flexibility in the policy that does state exemptions can be made. Um, the bleach, the, in terms of specifically uh, the issue in Abergavenny, a block street training consent was previously agreed by this committee and issued to the estate section to implement. Um, so block street training consents are covered again in our street training policy, so we obviously adhered to that. So on Bank Holiday Saturday, estates issued that consent to Pride Pub by the training post, which is on Neville Street. So that consent was issued by estates to allow six traders to operate from St. John's Square on that bank holiday Saturday. Um, we understand that the estates did indeed approach those traders to advise them of the, the consent. Um, so speaking to the estate section, they said they didn't have any adverse comments off uh, traders in the vicinity at the time, and hence they proceeded with the, with the consent. So estates issued the consent to say yes, these six traders will, will uh, be on site on the 24th of August. Um, the reason I refer to an ice cream uh, vendor is um, that one of the comments from the members was, you know, we, there's no good having a policy saying do not trade within 100 meters if uh, we just sort of rub, run, rub, um, if we don't actually apply that. In this particular case, the event on the 24th of August was a one-off, uh, which is very different to the specific trader who actually was there on the 24th. He's consistently applied to operate on St. John's Square on a regular basis, up to two or three times a week, and that's been refused. So we are adhering to the policy in terms of uh, having uh, regard to those permanent premises, selling ice cream in that vicinity. So just to make that point that was raised, that if we have got something that states not within 100 meters, do we or do we not? Uh, actually apply it, so we do apply it with exceptional circumstances. Um, block street training consents, I think members will be aware of where they operate in other areas, and they have been very beneficial, not just to licensing section because it's less onerous on us, but also for those uh, towns themselves. So for example, Chepso and Ask are both operated by the town councils, um, and that's gone very well. So my chair will be aware of the Ask Christmas Fair, so it stops uh, Lee, Sam, and other licensing officers dealing with the very detailed where the stalls go, etc. It allows someone else to facilitate that. So we issue the Block Street Train Consent, and we would say that's beneficial both to the traders and a very limited um, capacity in terms of licensing section. So it does operate in other towns, and also in uh, Caldicott Country Park, um, Mon Lives operate that. Um, in terms of the block street training. So in terms of this issue about are we supportive of local businesses, I suggest we are as a section. Uh, so for example, St. John's Square was the pertinent point that was raised. So the King's Arms, which is uh, the pub on that, uh, in that area, directly opposite St. John's Square. And we did permit five temporary event notices uh, last year, further four so far this year, to allow them to extend their trading. Uh, so they do have barbecues, etc., cetera, onto what is MCC property in terms of the paved area directly opposite the, the public house. So that sort of em emphasizes we are there to support and I think, you know, um, locally, I think they do see our role as being positive in terms of uh, permissions, etc. cetera. Um, so further to the particular incident, which did involve the states clearly, um, there was a meeting on the 9th of September. So Linda and Lee attended that with colleagues in highways markets team, which is part of the estates team, just to determine what actually occurred on the 24th and what we can do to improve that. Um, and so for example, um, perhaps that consultation, if it is a block street training consent, just to make sure they are notified and they recognize they have been, we understand that they were. But also a second issue is I chair the event safety advisory group, Linda is the vice chair. 
Certainly, if we know about events, we can ensure, to the best of our ability, that things don't clash. So potentially, this would have gone OK unheeded without any um, concerns, potentially, had it not been for the topping out event that occurred on the other uh, side of town. So uh, what we'd look to do is to ensure that there aren't any uh, clashes in the future. So that really is covering what actually occurred as a consequence of that and our responses. So on the 18th of September, the uh, council's estate section um, wrote to us to advise that they, they want to amend that existing block street trading consent. Then the existing consent finishes now next February. And what they want to do in terms of that amendment is to provide a consent only for those streets in the direct vicinity of the market hall. So it's Cross Street, Market Street, High Street, and the lower brewery yard. So the areas in and around the market hall. Uh, that would have implications. So in terms of what I've tried to do in 3.3, and Lee's helped me in this as the local licensing officer, in terms of what potentially are the challenges, if you like, and changes if um, estates, uh, like I say, change that existing consent. So that outline, we'll go through it line by line. There are implications in terms of time. Um, so estates, if you have got a breach training, they can turn that around fairly quickly in terms of uh, an application to them to trade. Conversely, from a licensing perspective, we'd have to look at each of those um, individual um, traders to apply for be it a day street trading consent, for example, and that consultation would take 60 days. So suddenly we're into a bit more of an administrative process because that's what, the, that's what uh, we'd have to adhere to. Consultees, I suppose on a positive note, if um, local members say, well, could we be consulted on any uh, street trading? Well, if, if it does all revert back to licensing officers, then as per the right-hand column, we would need to consult with the local member, the town council, highways, police, and Bram Clough, Sutra, obviously, if a trunk road is involved. So there are issues in terms of if it comes to us. Cost, um, the states would suggest uh, that they don't make any um, profits in terms of that. They say they do it at cost. So they come back, have, having seen the report, they would say that actually it's not part of their core business and we don't want to do it anymore, basically. Um, so from a licensing perspective, those street trading fees are set and members be aware we set fees obviously um, February, March time and ready for the financial year. Um, certainly, um, there isn't a great um, income to be brought from that because it's on a cost recovery basis as per um, central guidance on that matter. So uh, another issue would be if permissions are refused, then estates can say yay or nay because they're the consent holders. Um, from a licensing perspective, it reverts back to officers here. Then we'd have to go through a process of that application would need to allow time for potentially that objection being going back to this committee if people are objecting on grounds of safety or unsuitable siting, et cetera. So flexibility, um, and Lee's given an example here, the food festival. So when they change things around last minute, for example, uh, the Block Street training holder can obviously make those amendments fairly quickly uh, as outlined. However, if it comes back to licensing to administer that, we would need to um, go through a due process on that, and we could potentially need to cancel something and to reapply if, there was, if the objections were significant enough to warrant that. So I think the point we're trying to make is more prescribed if it's with licensing than potentially with someone, not necessarily in a state section, because I see town councils also hold it. It becomes more prescribed if it sits with uh, licensing. So the workload is, is a capacity issue. Obviously, it, it'd save the states a job unless it's not part of their core business. But conversely, if it's with license, then, then uh, we're going to have a, a, a lot more to do in terms of non-ticketed events. So again, if you're familiar with Bailey Park, the steam rally will be ticketed, so everything within is covered within that event. However, when it's not ticketed, um, rugby tournaments and that sort of thing, and a burger van will appear, we would then have to start processing those individual traders in those public places where this is non-ticketed. So, so basically, the, the very last point there, as a small team, this can be time-consuming, especially for large events, and licensing officers are likely to struggle.
And if we, you know, unless we forget, there's four licensing officers across the county, and that obviously covers the entire county. Um, so basically, in under three, four, um, what was suggested as a further meeting, so in terms of how we take that forward, helpful probably to take that to discussion more widely, if you like, um, because if I'm just sort of um, recap on the estates um, thing, uh, in terms of their opinion, so Deb Hill Howells is the head of service for that um, section. So she emailed me, emailed me on the 9th of October just to outline the concerns from an estates perspective. Like I say, they don't think there's any financial benefit from the estates being involved with that. Um, she, she contends it's not part of the estate's core business. We don't have the resources to undertake that element of it, which can be quite onerous. As highlighted by the recent issue, which I've outlined this morning, uh, there are different service areas, and perhaps we need to streamline that. And we've got, um, sorry to keep going on about the food festival, but Caldicott, uh, sorry, Cheps, uh, not Chepster Castle, Abergavenny Castle is in Abergavenny. Uh, Abergavenny Castle will charge, not as um, I hasten to add, the Marquis of Abergavenny will charge uh, the food festival for the use of Abergavenny Castle. So these costs can add up. Um, so I think that's another issue is we just need to get back together as to what that means for event organizers. Um, so Deb goes on to say that we don't have a service need to be involved. So they'd much rather simplify and just deal with their, their part of the business, which they were suggested, the running of the market. Um, so they don't want to get involved with the, the other events that she was suggesting. It's quite onerous on them and also not any financial benefit for, for so doing. So to conclude that they are of the opinion we no longer to no longer hold that Block Street Trading con um, uh, consent from uh, when it expires in February next year. So um, she wanted that mentioned in this uh, committee meeting to say that they don't want to undertake any Block Street Trading consents beyond their own market requirements from, as I say, February 2020. So that's the sort of that's changes then, Chair 2 2, which I'll get to. Um, so hopefully I've outlined exactly what the issues were. So I think that's the first thing. This is what happened and this is what the response was. And secondly, in, in terms of the way forward, which I think is probably recommendation 2-2, um, probably if you could leave it with us, perhaps chair as a, a licensing section to have those discussions. But um, potentially one of those discussions would be with Abergavenny Town Council. Uh, so like I say, it successfully operates in Chepstow and Usk. Um, so perhaps we could have that further discussion to make it less onerous on what's a very limited uh, resource with us. So you're always trying to work with the town councils. I mean, going off subject slightly, dog fouling, we get in the town council to do a lot more about that in terms of awareness and dealing with that because we haven't got the resource to deal with that. So similarly, I think Block Street Training Consent has been quite a good example of uh, taking that away from the local authority, not complete because we issue the street training consent, but certainly helpful in terms of administration, in terms of that day-to-day -day management of um, what can be like a street market, and potentially taking that to the town council for discussion. Um, and I think the second bit, if you like, in terms of further discussion is the impact on events. So certainly we can do that through the event safety advisory group, because you've got the police and the fire service and other partners around the table in terms of uh, what does it look like for them. Um, so in terms of costs, potentially, if there's an increase in cost, how viable is it? Um, so I think there's two bits, really. How do we administer Block Street Training Consents? Would someone else pick it up? And secondly, just have to due regard to um, events, because I think members will agree that without significant events within the county, we certainly lose some of our um, interest, shall we say. And we're, we're all about making our Towns more viable and interesting. So happy to take questions, Chair. Uh, thank you, David, very much. Uh, a couple of questions already. I, I'd just like to say that as far as USC is concerned, I know it works very, very successfully with the Town Council. Uh, Simon, first of all. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I just need to be clear in my head here. This is talking about one individual case here, but on the bigger picture here, it's talking about everywhere in Monmouthshire, really, isn't it? Not just the towns. So an example for me would be if somebody set something up in an area where they were, let's say, just under 100 metres from a fish bar, let's say, and that fish bar closes at 7 o'clock at night, 
and they're operating from six o'clock till 10 o'clock at night, going what you've said there, they're actually probably within the scope there, aren't they, of, of being allowed to operate within what we've just said. And I just need to be clear on the policy here that we, we're trying to implement here. So if that setup isn't on public land, if it's on private land, it's virtually the same as well, isn't it? So let me give you uh, an example then. I find a lot of public houses now are actually setting up um, uh, traders to come along and do all sorts of foods at night, let's say, because they probably haven't got the kitchens or they haven't got the licenses to do that, which keeps the pubs busy and whatever. So going back to this policy we have, the 100 metres is important to tick the box. After that then, that is sole discretion of where we go with this, is it? I, I'm just trying to, because I can see a lot more of this happening that a lot of public houses will bring in, let's say, outside caterers to carry out functions. I, I see a lot more of it now. That policy, what we've just said, would operate for a, a village in land soil or a village in wherever, yes? Exactly the same, yeah? If I can reply to that, Chair. Um, yeah, so the report refers to um, the street trading policy, so, and it refers to section seven. So just to be clear, the third bullet, the, the use to quote, the use shall not be located in 100 meters of an listing shop, restaurant, hot food takeaway, those holding street trading consents and markets, which includes block consents, which primarily sells the same goods. This may be relaxed for one-off or short-term applications. So in the situation that Councillor Howarth uh, outlined, certainly does apply to Gilwood, I know we had an issue there, doesn't we, in terms of a pub that's set up with a, a van. What I would say is sometimes these vans are specialist caterers and they pull in a huge trade, so some of the other trades might benefit from it. So it's not necessarily a negative thing for the others. You'd expect, obviously, the specific premises that invited them on site to benefit, why would they do it? You presume there's some sort of uh, cash incentive to do that. Um, but certainly you can have benefits from even a burger van turning up because it does pull in others. It's more we'll go for a drink after and we'll do X, Y, and Z. So it can be that. So I think to, to answer your question, it's, it's by, in terms of this, um, it depends on the interest of the other people within the town. If they were objecting to say we really to oppose that licensing section, we obliged to look into that. Um, but as a policy decision, we shouldn't have them trading at the same time. Is there Blinda wants to answer that? Um, yeah, speak? another thing I wanted to um, bring a, a point to you as well. Um, you said about private and, and public land. If people got access without payment, it's still regarded as a street. But there is also an exemption in street trading consent. So if, say, uh, you give an example of a, a pub that would normally have a kitchen that normally sells food, if they set up a burger van immediately outside, because they normally have that activity inside, it becomes exempt under street trading as well. So that's why you get the likes, for example, say a shop um, selling ice creams inside, and then they have a little uh, uh, sort of fridge mm -hmm. out immediately outside the venue selling the same goods it wouldn't be under the remit of street trading, so something to bear in mind as well. Councillor Guppy. Thank you. Sorry, I'm maybe playing devil's advocate a bit here. I was just, just trying to get my head round. Um, this was only a one-off event, um, and there was just mention of a burger van, but there was other stalls and permitted within St. John's, St. John's Square. I just wanted that clarified. There was. Yeah, there's another six. I don't know if Lee can expand on who the other six were. I know one was an ice yeah. cream vendor. So <laughs> the one that seems to cause an issue is the, is the Beefy Boys, who may as well say who it is. Uh, they're the burger van, based in Hereford. And do gourmet burgers, it's not something that... Yeah. Yeah, so that was one. I know that uh, ice cream vendor. Anyone else, Lee, the other four? Yeah, for these, I can't confirm 100%, yeah. but I, I was informed that a couple of the traders were from the local area and from the market as well, so that's how they were invited okay. to, to trade. It, it's just that I'm not... It's been specifically mentioned about a burger van, but I just, um, from the policies and, and your explanation, you know, 
um, it's all been covered, it's all been carried out correctly um, under the clauses of you know, the existing policy at the moment. But I'm not quite sure what's happening here in, in view of the complaint, because actually when there's food festivals, that also is food, but a burger van is a food, and it seems as though, you know, ice, ice cream is food. Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure what the issue is, um, and it, is it being blown out of perspective that actually it's, it's okay for the food festival, but not on, on exceptions, and they're not happening, you know, is it once a year, or, or, you know, it could be like twice a year, and obviously there's been complaints. Um, but what, have we had complaints about the traders? Or is it just, he said bring the come, but what exactly did bring come, what were exactly they complaining about? Because it, it seems to be that, that we've had clarity that everything has been um, taken place correctly in the policies and procedures, which is, um, thank you for that explanation, and that's been ex um, explained um, to the complainants. But was there anything else? Uh, no, I think that was the nature of it. it was uh, I presume you know the topping out ceremony is something that I know uh, some of our members have gone to, and they, I think they were a bit surprised, taken aback perhaps as to how a burger van would be located on St John's Square. On I don't know, or something that might be fairly deemed to be a fairly high profile event. We are absolutely right, and that's what I tried to say in the introduction. Uh, we can't say you know that's something we're not particularly keen on. But we like the food fest because it cheeses and seems a bit more nicey nicey, should we say? Um, probably not the right term. Um, so I'm just, nothing I'm just wondering, happened. should we? Um, I know some of these burger vans. You, you know, they they um, it's, it's not they're, they're at market burger vans, and I think actually, you know, uh, sometimes if you categorise a burger van, it might be something that's sort of a quick, um, you know perhaps not as high quality food from what you're telling me it was um it, you know uh, of of a high quality um so i'm not quite sure here you know this seems to be there's going to be a lot of changes and you said that there, there could be cost implications but but we've got policies and processes to um control this and if there's going to be major changes to the policy are, are we you know cutting our nose off <laughs> um, yeah just to be clear we're not looking we're not seeking to change the policy we think that's uh, fit for purpose so it's three and a half years old now so it's still yeah, that's fine so it's just how we go it's how we hand over if you like the responsibility to the block street trading block street trading consent comes here for decision so members say us chepstow will come here on an annual basis if it's, if it's uh, Nothing materially different. We'll do that through the chair and vice chair to say you're still happy for that USC, for example, block street train sense to continue. So that doesn't involve changing the policy mm. on trading. It's just how we go about implementing, if you like. So at the moment, what I've tried to do is describe what happens in Abbey Venny specifically. It's administered by the estates section. Because it's been raised by members and Brynner come, yeah. then we're just saying that, well, we just need to think that through. So I, I think what we're seeking in terms of the future is uh, licensing committee agree that licenses and officers will go away to liaise with other people, particularly the town council, to see if there's a way forward in terms of how we best administer the system going forward, if you like, because uh, estates have been quite clear as to they don't see it as core business, they don't want to do it anymore. Fair enough. So we're just going to have to work through what works best. So the reason I mentioned the costs is I think particularly the food festival prior to September, raised concerns about what the, the <coughs> costs are going up. So I know the castle charged them some, some money through the Marquis, so it's not a profit line for the council. Um, but if potentially you've got two block street trading consents going on, that's going to be an added cost to the food festival. And it's not just, let's, let's be clear, it's not just about the food festival, it's about all the other events up yeah. and down the county. Yeah. I think um, the, the point, obviously, of the report <coughs> is to, <coughs> excuse me, is to say that when we issue a block street trading consent, what that means is the consent actually covers that whole area. So if you take away that block street trading consent and is only done for certain streets, it still means that if it's trading taking place that require it by law to have a consent, we still have to process. So 
that makes it more onus on the licensing section because whereas you'd have one block street trading and people would use that block street trading because it's in place that won't be the case so it means that every time a trader goes there we would have to do duly process a consent every time for those that are not covered and that's what the point was trying to make that you know it will be onerous on license and onerous on the individuals because they have to wait for that consent to be processed and put through yes yeah have we had any um, discussions with the town council? At um, because, uh, in fairness to, uh, to um, Deb Hill House, I only spoke to her last week. Um, <clears throat> so she's responded sort of formally, if you like, on the 9th of October. So that was only last week, wasn't it? Um, so I haven't had an opportunity yet. Okay. Um, as it happens, I, I am due to meet to the clerk soon. Um, so I'll raise it then in terms of it's something that could be discussed by the town council going forward. Okay. And just to clarify, none of the traders actually, none of the, um, the shops actually complained. Is that correct? Well, we're not 100% clear on the, on the source of the complaint. They weren't um, forthcoming as to where they said they saw it firsthand and they didn't like it. And they thought particularly this business rates issue was a concern for them. Whether someone's complained, we, we didn't get anything to say it's... X, Y, and Z traders are, uh, you know, throwing their arms up saying it's a disgrace. Um, but whether members are acting on behalf of some of the people within their wards, we're not, we're not 100% sure. Okay. Um, sorry, this is not necessarily uh, an ongoing license, and perhaps reassurance. You know, we could make make some reassurance. Um, I don't know if there's a um, commerce, you know, um, trade commerce committee or something in Chepstow, um, Abergavenny. Um, if if I just clarify, so we received prior before the event took place, we received notification when it was first advertised um, from a, a local trader who made us aware that if the event went ahead with just one burger van then it would be in breach of the policy which is within 100 meters of a retail premises also selling burgers so what we did was we as a licensing section when we get complaints we we would first go to the license holder which at the moment is the estates team and we had discussions with them over the event and advised them on what they could do and what they shouldn't be doing so we we did offer that advice that's when they made it more of an event with numerous traders trading as a one-off event just to see how it went and then we had um, members raise concerns uh, after the event had taken place but no no other retail premises complained directly to us thank you uh, councillor webb thank you chairman yes Garrick, and thank you for the report um i don't think there's anything that we can really question in that and that um the recommendations on 2122 um, are actually noted. There's no decision to be made, but that the med local members are fully kept informed throughout the process, please. Yeah, just to add to Councillor Webb's comment, just on the 2-2, um, if it's okay with the, with the chair and the committee, well, those further discussions, as I said earlier, yeah. would be not necessarily the estate section now. Um, certainly with the town council and others that may be interested in picking up the block street training consent element. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roden. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in 2.1, you, you say you're looking to consider any areas for improvement, so under that uh, heading, do the mobile vans have hygiene ratings, like stores? That's the first question. Yeah, um, certainly, obviously, if they're um, registered in Monmouthshire, certainly we would look to our environmental health team would look at that. And certainly in this specific, specific case of this one, um, we always check to see where they're from and what's the hygiene rating. This particular one's based in Hereford and a five-star rating. So we do always check to make sure they're legitimate. In terms of events as well, we also do that. So um, with event organizers, steam rallies, etc., they may bring their own people along. We always check with the organizers who's coming in terms of catering. We've got three burger vans, an ice cream vendor, and a kebab. We always check to see who are they, and we'll check with the local authorities to what that star rating is. And most of them say if they're not three and above, we're not going to accept them. So it's, it's quite well covered. Thank you. Uh, well, if there are no other uh, 
questions. We'll go on to the recommendations now. Um, uh, we'll take them both together, I think, 2-1 and 2-2. Two, two. Uh, all in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Item four on the agenda is uh, to discuss further an application received uh, for a tuk, sorry, tuk tuk as a private hire vehicle. Uh, I think that uh, Linda is going to lead on this one. Uh, yeah, this uh, report has been brought today. It's a, an information um, report uh, because we've had um, somebody come forward saying they would like to sort of. Um, license themselves as a, as a pedicab, uh, a tuk-tuk. So um, the report here highlights um, some of the issues that we've, I've looked at. Um, we can't sort of uh, make um, an approval really today because we're still awaiting information. So we just give you the heads up really of what to look out for, um, what sort of type of vehicle it is, what the proposed conditions was, what we currently got as well in the policy itself. So if I start off with that, currently in the policy, initially it was, because we've never had one in um, this area, it was initially um, recommended it was going to be for hackney carriages and we would get highways to do, um, consult with highways on the roads it would go on. Um, since then, obviously, now this has come to light that um, one wanted to be licensed, it would be more pertinent, really, for it to be private hire licensing if we do um, eventually approve it. Um, and the reason behind that is because of the nature of the vehicles with the Hackney, they're able to go on ranks, they're able to have roof lights, um, and it would be a better place, as in 3.2 of the report, that it would be private hire purposes. So that would need to be changed on the policy if it does eventually go through. Highways, um, when we um, went to highways, it's not in the body of the report, but what they said is if it's roadworthy, they wouldn't get involved in what type of roads it would go on, basically. All right? So what we need to look at um, with regards to tech tech, so if I can explain, first of all, what is a tech tech and what the difference is as well to um, rickshaws as well. So if you do license, you would have to look at all elements of three sort of wheeled vehicles in, a, in essence. So if you look at 3.3 .3 of the report, a tech tech or rickshaw can be pedaled, electric, ele electrically motorized or powered by a traditional two-stroke engine. The design is the driver to the front and the passenger seated to the rear. A tech tech are the same design as electric and cycle rickshaws, so that's the pedaled ones you can have, or the electric ones, the pedicabs. However, rickshaws are small and can only carry two passengers in the rear of the vehicle. Um, these vehicles are, if used for higher reward, falls into the remit of licensing because of the fact it is high in reward and we're best suited for private hire license due to the nature of the vehicle, which is what I've, I've just mentioned. So the vehicle in question that wants to, um, to be licensed, which is a copy of today, is um, the larger of the vehicles. However, they would want to only have like two passengers in the rear of the vehicle if they do get plated. Now, the report um, looks at the, uh, the fact that the tuk-tuk may uh, on this occasion hold a valid MOT, but it's essential from licensing perspective that we look at the safety of those vehicles um, when on the use. Um, with a normal vehicle, which I've highlighted in 3.6 of the report, uh, a normal vehicle has such vast um, areas to protect passengers. So they could have things like safety features as um, airbags, crumple zones, anti-lock braking system, and the list goes on, and it gets more and more as cars progress and things. Well, however, this wouldn't be the case with regards to a rickshaw or a tuk-tuk. Um, because of the nature of it, it, is, it hasn't got side impact. It's got um, like a, a screen on the side, as in the picture, you know, to um, make it sort of uh, weatherproof. But it has, certainly hasn't got the um, technology behind it, as in 3.6, that a car would normally offer. So that's something that you're going to have to think about when we do actually get the full report actually coming your way as well. So <clears throat> with that in mind, what we try to do in licensing, if it does get approved, is that we would try and look as best as possible 
what conditions could we put in place to try and get some of the safety elements? It's impossible to get it all because of the nature of the vehicle. So in the report is actually um, a quick breakdown on Appendix A of the type of conditions that would be proposed to try and deal with some of the um, safety elements. But as I mentioned, you can't get it all. You know, we can't get all of safety elements because of the vehicle itself. So that's really the report today. What we're awaiting um, from uh, the actual um, element of this report is to get a further report from BOSA. Because in our normal policy, we got M1 classification. And what that means is that, say, for example, you had a, a van that was adapted um, and is now carrying passengers. Um, you know, so you've got disabled access and the van has been converted. We would recommend that they would actually have to have an M1 classification to say it's passenger roadworthy. And similarly, with regards to the rickshaw, we've raised that query with um, the BOSA and we are awaiting a response. Is if they didn't have that M1 classification from date of registration, would they be able to get a single vehicle approval? Because we are unclear with whether that could be the case, because it's not been adapted. It's not like a limousine where you adapt a, a larger vehicle for passenger use. It's actually the, the make of the vehicle is as it stands. It's a rickshaw or a tuk-tuk. So um, we're awaiting a response based on that to get that element further to include in there on passenger usage. So not only try and get the safety element saying, well, we would expect that one step further. So until we get that report really basically from them saying if it's possible or not, um, because it was in another policy in another local authority that they required that, but we wanted to check can they actually physically get it. We can't put a policy in place if there's no way that they could actually get that for it as well. So like I said, the today is looking at um, A, the safety of it, where it would be used, where it would be su would it be suitable in Gwent, because we, you've got to bear in mind um, in other ones, the nearest one in the report that I've mentioned is in Cardiff. They have dedicated um, taxi lanes, so they're not in the flow of traffic. So there's all a number of elements, and that will be brought in the next report, really, once we get the BOSA um, um, confirmation. We will look at then what you would feel would be the best course of action if we do license them, what conditions we would put in place. So that's um, the, the report today. I welcome any questions really on that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Higginson, then Councillor Howard. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. The one I've got is on Appendix A. It said the vehicle shall only be used for special occasions and executive business contracts. Vehicles licensed within this category shall not be used for everyday private hire use. The vehicle will be licensed as a private hire vehicle only. The question is, how could we um, police everyday use then? Uh, that's, the, that's the question. It goes. It, it, we've already heard that the licensing officers are, are, are under a, 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 a fair amount of pressure work-wise. And if, if you have this tuck tuck in, how are they going to police this? Because yeah, you talk about every day, really, aren't you? Um, with, because it would be um, classed as private hire vehicle, it would mean they would need to have an operator base. So as with all operator bases, um, we would inspect to see how bookings are made. So if they haven't got a record of those bookings, because that falls, in, all the other elements un under the policy um, would still be the same. Obviously, it would be unique for a tuk-tuk with the conditions. But all other um, elements of the policy, like looking at records, seeing what bookings are used, what um, drivers they use, as, you know, um, the driver would have to have the same sort of driving license as you would for the vehicle with the necessary checks. So all that elements would be checked, but you quite rightly say it would be a case of officers checking the base, seeing how those bookings are made, and, it, um, and enforcing, if it comes to light, that it isn't classed as um, a, a unique sort of booking, similar to, because we, we're going on the same lines as with limousines, because it's not a normal, every day you pick up somebody from a shop, you know, with a normal private hire vehicle, it would be a special occasion booking. So, so to come back on that, so pre, every, any any uh, hiring would be pre-booked, is that right? That's right, because it would be a private hire vehicle class as that, rather mm -hmm. than a hackney carriage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Howard. Oh, oh, right. oh, just, just to expand on that, the, <coughs> the person who's made the application has uh, stated that he wants to have 
dedicate uh, designated tour routes that he would uh, provide. So that would be his business. He would only do a certain route, um, whereby he would then avoid certain dual carriageways, etc. Um, but that, yeah, it would be diff difficult for us to enforce where that vehicle is being used, uh, as you mentioned. And similarly, if you grant a policy, um, obviously this is one person coming, but then it would open up the floodgates for others to um, come on board, and you would have to make your, your policy as stringent as possible in order to have the safety element and to see what you would expect if somebody else wanted to apply. Councillor Howard. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of things for me is, can we make sure that we bring the final report, we have good examples of um, areas where these are operating, and I know you use Cardiff there, um, that probably isn't a good example for us on the basis mm -hmm. of um, the area and like you said, they've got the bus lanes, it may be somewhere like Denbyshire or I'm just trying to picture mm -hmm. an area that yeah. we are, mm -hmm. let's say, identical to, to a point mm -hmm. and put them in the report just gives us something then to just compare. I think that'd be important. With, um, and the other thing is, is the VOSA one as well is, is that report that they send back there, I, I think that's important that goes in the report to members as well, so we can actually just have a good look at that. I'm not not saying I don't trust you, but I'm just saying it's actually important as well for, for safety. And you did mention the registration of these tuk-tuks, comes wherever, I can't remember what the other name is. I have seen them, other parts of the world, mind you, but do they not actually have to be MOT'd? This one in particular has got an MOT, it is roadworthy. It will have to be. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fair enough. That yeah, so you, would still, right. you still need the check and we would have to have checks in our okay. garages as per our normal. Because they'll have speedos on them and everything then, <laughs> so for mileage usage. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. I think a key issue, isn't it, for members to discuss when it does come forward, and yes, Councillor Howard is right, we'll include those elements. We are thinking across England where, you know, where they're used <laughs> safely. Um, but I think the fundamental difference is if you want to jump on a moped and fling yourself around Abergrew, I think that's... Uh, over Slampoist Bridge, you sort of picture the road network. That's your individual decision, isn't it? it'd be a pedal bike or a, uh, or a motorised bike. I think obviously from our perspective, it'd be uh, something the licensing authority would need to be clear in terms of that safety issues for reasons that Linda's gone through, because we are now licensing paying passengers. So I think that's the fundamental difference, isn't it? It's a bit more than, yes, it's roadworthy. It can be for an individual. Um, but certainly from a licensing perspective, we issue a license, we've got to be clear from a licensing regulatory yeah. committee perspective that you're happy with those arrangements. Not just, you know, a, a, a push bike in a garage is perfectly safe, it's when you take it onto the highway network, it suddenly becomes more hazardous. So that's the issue really, isn't it, in terms of um, how do we get people around as paying passengers. I guess one of the issues is, is traffic volumes and speed, isn't it? The only time I've been in one is Bangkok. Well, because the traffic doesn't move, um, it's, you never get above two miles an hour, so it's never, you're never going to get hit by a HGV wagon because no one's actually moving any, in my experience. Um, I'm sure members have got further experiences. It just depends where it is, really, in terms of that environment. Yeah. Councillor Webb. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Like Councillor House, I'd be really interested to see how this works in other areas. I'm really pleased that we're not saying no, that we're looking into this and you're doing more investigation, which is really good. These things have got far more sophisticated than they were. Um, I noticed we were in, in London at the weekend and they're very <coughs> much more sophisticated. They're not like they were originally with things hanging out and this and there. They're very tidy, tidy now. Um, and I was pretty and um, Councillor Evans has just mentioned to me that perhaps it would be a good idea if um, one could be brought down here for us to have a look at at some stage or other. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Guffey. Yep, we, a lot of discussion is about the electric um, tuk tuk, um, but it might be um, that um, somebody might want to go more into the, the, the pedicabs. In which case, you know, it might be sort of short journeys, you know, from the town to, the, or to the station. Um, in the, you know, there's lots of activities taking place in the town, um, and and I think uh, we need to sort of branch out um, because we're going to have perhaps different routes um, for a non-motorized motorized, um, vehicle, um, 
and um, I think we need, uh, th there's almost going to be um, two lots of conditions, um, or separate conditions uh, for the two types of vehicles that are in use at the moment. And it might be <clears throat> that these tuk-tuks might come forward that they might be um, electric. So we need sort of, you know, it might be a promotion of, you know, keeping it, uh, our carbon emissions down if they're going to go, you know, t turn electric. Uh, it, it seems a positive way forward if we can um, act toward, you know, make a progress towards that. That This might be an up-and-coming um, policy and an up-and-coming business, um, particularly sort of in the rural areas. Um, I, I would just think in the south of the county, you know, try and get a, a, get a bus from Seven Tunnel um, um, to, to Mega, Port Skewit, Cowent, you, you know, it's a nightmare, but it might be that somebody can, you know, um, afford a, a small unit and, and you know, t take two passengers and it might, this industry might explode. So I, I, I think we need to, to look around. Um, it says about limitations of use. If you think in um, London, um, out when it's outside the shows, there's the tuk-tuks, particularly the, ped and the pedicabs, they're, they're always hanging about um, the shows. So, you know, maybe we can, maybe not add in if, you know, we could put a limitation initially, but in view of, you know, an extended period um, of the hire, because it might be that, uh, you know, we want, you know, it might be that somebody wants to just sort of turn up at the station in view of, you know, b being, you know, a smaller taxi service, but uh, it would be w worth, I think if we could maybe look at what policies there are in London or the, the, the larger cities, it doesn't mean that we have to use them, but it means it, it might mean that we can get over some of the problems, um, and particularly with the electric and the motor, electrical, uh, no, well, the motorised vehicles and the, the pe pedicabs, um, and we've got lots of cycle routes, and, uh, and I think there might be lots of do's and don'ts about you know if they take shortcut through a park or you know, shortcut through a pedestrian area with, uh, I know we have lots of problems with bikes going through towns and things. Um, and I just think, you know, no, please, can we not rush into this policy? I know that, um, that there's somebody showing um, an interest, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, but if we try and get it right um, and, you know, wish you well, um, this, this is an exciting policy, really, um, um, for our rural county. Yeah, exactly that. Obviously, it is a, a policy, and as with all policies, it can be amended as it evolves. There's no legislation, you know, and then as the times change as well, we can sort of bring it back to this committee and say, well, this has happened now, and we can alter it. So it's quite easy to do that, but I, I take on board, you know, I have trolled a number of authorities, and I'll be going back to them to sort of say, well, what are the issues? Now you've been running it for a while. What are the issues that you find, you know, to try and get it as robust as we possibly can at the offset as well. Thank you. I was going to say, it's going to be oh, a lot of work, me. but, um, you know, commend the officers. It's, you know, a good business venture, really, for, for quite, it could be for quite a few people, so. Uh, thank you, Linda. Oh, sorry, Richard, Richard Road. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was very concerned about the maximum speed that these tuk-tuks can go, 37 miles an hour. Um, I was just uh, thinking about what would happen if they were on a dual carriageway. So I was quite pleased to hear that the, there is an idea about having proposed routes, and if that was to uh, uh, form part of the application in the future, it would uh, move me towards being more favorable than I am at the moment. Thank you. Early. So, yeah, there's a couple of the points there. With, with regards to the cycle ones in particular, in certain cities you might have designated zones which are not the whole city but just a, a small area of, of that city whereby somebody would be authorised as a, similar to a hackney then to sit in the street and wait for passengers to approach them and they would have a small zone which they would cycle around whereby they would take into consideration the, the road network or uh, and distance etc. Um, for this one, this is more private hire whereby it would all be pre-booked work so he would not be um, sat in a, in a street waiting for people to approach him. He would be 
taking internet or phone bookings, etc., and getting his trade that way. So that's 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 where we we're, we're considering. Uh, one other thing as well, the we've mentioned uh, the VOSA quite a few times. So just for the purpose of report, is VOSA is uh, now DVSA, so the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency. So VOSA is no longer in a, in existence. Thank you. Uh, well, the uh, recommendations are, are there. I think uh, possibly we might want to see uh, one of these, as someone said, possibly here, or in action perhaps in a, a neighbouring county if there is one. Um, uh, perhaps we could uh, arrange for the committee to have a look uh, as and when the time is, is right. Anyway, I'm, sure, I'm sure the applicant would, um, you know, would want to do that in yes. a way to promote its uh, vehicle. Anyway, uh, the recommendations are there. Um, are you happy with them both and that we should vote in favour? All in favour? Thank you very much, unanimous. Uh, item five is to confirm and sign the minutes of the previous meeting, uh, which was held on... Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Held on the, the 18th of July. Moved, seconded. All in favour? Thank you. And uh, to note the, the uh, date and time of the next meeting, 10 o'clock on uh, Tuesday, the 26th of November. Okay? Thank you all very much. <laughs>